You and Your Money is brought to you by Money Max, Focal, Fidelity, and Sun Oil. Good day. Welcome to another edition of You and Your Money. I'm your host for the day, Carlos Mackey, and we're excited to talk about economic growth today on this show. I'm also very excited because of the fact that we have two of the brightest financial and economic minds in the country uh, who are going to be contributing to this interview session. Firstly, we have Mr. Gowan Bo, who is the CEO of the Fidelity Group of Companies here with us. And we also have Mr. Peter Blair, Dr. Peter Blair, excuse me, who is a professor of edu- uh, economics at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. So we have what I would consider to be, in many respects, an excellent professional uh, perspective, as well as an excellent academic and research perspective. So Gawan, Peter, welcome to you and your money. Thank Thank you, Carlos. Carlos. Happy New Year. Absolutely. Happy New Year. So Gawan, you're here on the ground. Uh, We'll take this first question to you. Uh, I know you don't necessarily like these questions, but I have to ask it. If you were to make any recommendations to our, our legislative directorate, what would be those recommendations around uh, how we change any laws or policies in order for us to begin to see very rapidly in this first quarter of 2022, economic growth and development? Well, you know, it gives me an opportunity to sort of um, champion something I always do, and that's a national development plan. And the reason why I say that is because we need to have a longer-term strategy that has short and medium-term goals and milestones to achieve. Um, I think we have to remember that Rome wasn't built in a day. And we've had some very significant economic shocks in the form of Dorian and now COVID-19. And we have had a tremendous decrease in our productivity in the country globally, but specifically in the Bahamas. And from that perspective, I think it now becomes important for government to see themselves as a facilitator not a provider. Um, I think what became very apparent, particularly during the COVID-19 peak, was that uh, everyone turned to the government and we need to start building resiliency and what I'm going to say infrastructure to remove the dependency on government and create greater wealth distribution so that persons are better prepared. So I think if I were to sum it in a nutshell, uh, my view is that we have to now start behaving strategically, where we are not seeking to have um, just those low-hanging fruits, but actually see the whole tree. And so we need to start planting those seeds, watering them, nurturing them, so that we have full-blown trees to provide shade, fruit, and comfort in the future. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gowan. Peter, I'll ask you the same question. You're overseas, so... I want to put a little twist on it. When you think about our policy perspective and our legislative perspective, a lot of Bahamians often get kind of weary when we talk about foreign direct investment. Uh, We have various schools of thoughts as as to what we need to do with regard to foreign direct investment. Give us your take on what you would like to see happen with legislation and policy, especially when you think about foreign direct investment and how we talk about recovery and growth in this first quarter of 2022. Yeah, Carlos, thank you so much for having me here and good day Bahamas. I just wanna echo what my colleague Gawain said, which is that we need a national development strategy and we need it now. I just came from Long Island. I spent a day there with some of my cousins and it is a beautiful island. During this pandemic, something that we have to do is to de-densify. We should use this time as an opportunity to think about how do we deploy more people to the family islands and begin to build in place the infrastructure that would be needed to support communities in the family islands. So I think this is a perfect time for us to say, while the economy is at a bit of a standstill, while we don't have people moving up and down as much, let's think about what are the things that we can do strategically for the long term. With respect, Carlos, to the question of foreign direct investment, this was something that was one of the chapters in my PhD thesis at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. And the short version of it is in 1981, the Bahamas passed a law called the Movable Property Act, which made it very difficult for non bahamians to buy and sell land in the Bahamas. Traditional economic models would tell you that we're a small developing country with a lot of labor, but not a lot of capital. So we have a lot of people, but not a lot of machines. 
And so what we need is foreign direct investment to provide us with the capital or the machines and the equipment to make things happen. So when I looked at this particular policy experiment in the Bahamas, what we saw was that after the passage of the the Immovable Property Act, there was a reduction in foreign direct investment. Now, what you'd expect is to see a slowdown in GDP. But what we found was the opposite. There was no slowdown in GDP as foreign direct investment fell. If anything, GDP slightly increased. So what's the lesson from this? A lot of what we take from the textbooks of economic growth and development and just blindly apply them to our particular context does not fit. And so we need to rethink the role of foreign direct investment. And as an as a antidote to that, I think we need to provide opportunities and an environment where where businesses can be funded through a variety of sources. We can increase access to venture capital that's local. We can increase support for government grants for research and for seeding companies. And also we can increase the lending capacity of banks to young behemoths, not just for cars, but for starting businesses. And businesses that help us to think about ways that we can adapt schooling, ways that we can adapt commerce so that we can survive, not just survive through the pandemic, but even thrive in the years beyond. Alice, I think just one of the elements to, to, to reiterate on that one is foreign direct investment does not mean foreign direct investor. And to Peter's point in terms of how we open up the lanes of um, capitalizing our economy, I think we, we sometimes have a disconnect in understanding that foreign direct investment means foreign currency that is coming into the country to help for development. It doesn't mean that there should not be local participation. And our greatest challenge, as was in the actual state of um, the nation that we did for the National Development Plan, less than 20% of foreign direct investment stays within the economy of the Bahamas. And it's very simple that if someone comes and brings their money, when they leave, what are they taking with them? Their money. And they're hoping for profit. So we need to have uh, a model that allows for greater partnerships and what I'm gonna call strategic alliances that say, we welcome um, international funding, but what we want to achieve is the balance that has Bahamians um, being part owners in that. So as they earn, we retain some of that foreign currency and we remove our dependence on international persons to bring foreign currency. And we have a greater amount of Bahamians with foreign currency. Excellent. This is you and your money, and I'm your host, Carlos Mackey, and we are having a conversation with Gawain Bo, who is the CEO of the Fidelity Group of Companies, and Dr. Peter Blair, who is a professor of economics at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. We'll take the short break, and we'll be right back on you and your money. I didn't think I would ever pay down my debt. It's a new beginning. Fidelity Financial Coaching was the solution that I needed. Since 1967, Freeport Oil Company Limited has been dedicated to fueling growth and prosperity in the Bahamas. We have been a constant pillar within the country, striving to invest and support our community through the best of times and the worst of times. For us, Full Call represents 21 years of strength and consistency, consistent leadership, consistent growth, consistent customer service. Through it all, we are resilient. Full Call, fueling growth for people. extravaganza for a chance to win over forty thousand dollars in amazing prizes it's easy to win fuel up with twenty dollars gas at any shell service station complete the entry form on your receipt take a picture of it and whatsapp it to 422-0271 or upload it at winwithshellbahamas.com for a chance to win cash staycations grocery vouchers jumbo gift certificates free fuel and so much more Conditions apply. Happy holidays from Shell. 
I need a new start. It's a new beginning. I applied and got my lot loan from Fidelity. Finally, we're moving forward. Welcome back. This is You and Your Money. I'm your host, Carlos Mackey. And today we are talking about economic recovery and growth. Today on this interview session, we have Dr. Peter Blair, who is a professor of economics at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and Mr. Gowan Bo, who is the CEO of the Fidelity Group of Companies. Uh, Peter, I want to ask this particular question. You, you may mention in the first session or the first section of this interview uh, with regard to banking and capital availability. What's your perspective on banking in the Bahamas? Do you think that there is uh, an opportunity available to us to have what some would call a more equitable banking system? And in your view, what would be some of the features of a more equitable banking system that promotes recovery and growth in this particular context? Thank you so much, Carlos. I'll start with a quote from the late Dr. Miles Monroe, who says, when the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. We have to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of banks? The purpose of banks are they provide a vehicle for, for which households can store their resources and grow their resources. They also provide access to credit within the economy. And so then we have to think about, well, what lines of credit are being provided to Bahamians? As a young Bahamian, I can go in and get a loan for a car. If I wanted to get a loan for a home, it's more difficult. If I wanted to get a loan for a business, that's more difficult still. And so we have to think about what are the ways in which we're thinking strategically about deploying access to credit to especially young Bahamians for building a stronger economy. And what are some of the lanes that are a bit clogged up? And we have to think about the ways in which banks can be a facilitator for allowing more free access to opportunities to invest in developing businesses, to allow Bahamians to invest in having access to homes as well. Thank you, Peter. Gowan, you are in the banking business. Uh, there will be some that say, you know, we need to have a more equitable banking system. Peter's given what he thinks are the contours of what a more equitable banking system should be. Gowan, as somebody in the industry, uh, do you have anything to add or do you have a contrast that you would want our persons to take some consideration of when we think about having a banking system that really works to promote recovery, uh, but more so even past recovery in the short term, long term, we're thinking about how do we grow and foster a, a thriving and a definitely more vibrant uh, Bahamas. Darwin? You know, I, I would just, um, I think, echo something that Peter said in terms of understanding the purpose of banks and particularly banks in the Bahamas. Um, and the word I would use is fiduciary agents, that really we are, uh, if you will, the conduit that allows persons to safely store their money, as Peter said. And the way we give them a return is by lending it responsibly. Um, traditionally, the Bahamian context has been one where it was a less sophisticated market. And so it has traditionally been two individuals. It has not been um, the high, what I'm going to say, corporate banking and commercial banking that has been done in the context that we see in some of the larger territories. And equally, what we don't always appreciate is that is traditionally not only a separate division, but oftentimes a separate subsidiary that is capitalized on the basis of risk capital, meaning that the institution takes greater risk because its purpose, as Peter said, is to be a venture capitalist. It is to look for um, opportunities to take risks um, with the view of the higher the risk, the higher the return. And so in those scenarios, I can lend to 10 and two will pay for the 10. My aim is not to have eight fail, but I do have that large number of percentage that does take place when I get into venture capital world. So I think that we, we um, I think that the conversation has to just expand as to saying, well, what is the purpose of banks? If I were to turn it around and say to the depositor and the saver that I'm going to take on risk, but that could lose you um, a part of your deposit. So you deposited $1,000 um, and that forms part of the capital that I use to lend. If I lose $1,000, right, are you comfortable with me coming to you and saying, sorry, I took a chance. 
and I no longer can return that capital to you. And so when we have that understanding, um, I will be the first to say that our banking system needs to mature and evolve to where we do have more of that risk-taking um, arm of institutions. That is one that I'm encouraging my board of directors to say, as we start to have an equitable return, that we park some of that for more risky ventures. So it is not with the view of saying, give me $2 million that I can lose. It is more, give me $2 million that I can actually help to develop the nation by taking risk, high risk, um, but with a very careful incubation program that says, how do I teach and train businesses to put forward business plans and proposals that are actually at a level that allows me to assess cash flows? Too often, we see a lot of young persons with great ideas, but very little planning. And what they have to marry is the great concept with saying research to understand who is your market, research to understand the cost of developing that product or service, research that says what's the elasticity and how can it be priced, research that says how much do you need in order to get started and in the event of there being a slow ramp up. Every proposal I've ever seen makes a million dollars in the first year. And I say to them, if, it is in, if that is real, you don't even need to come to a bank because every man on the street that has some savings, if you tell him he's going to make a 100% return, on his money and is relatively guaranteed, will happily throw money at you. And the reality is it doesn't happen that way. It takes time, patience, but more importantly, um, deliberate action. Indeed, Gowan, we want to switch gears and I want to ask you very quickly with regard to our social system. And you you made an interesting uh, point early on where you talked about the government being a provider versus being a, a facilitator. Talk to us about where you see our social system going and what the implications of things like tax, tax policy uh, will, uh, you know, we just had a change in VAT from 12% to 10%. Talk about where you see our so social system needing to go and how things like tax policy are going to impact any movement uh, in, in our social uh, system planning such that we can actually utilize our social system to promote recovery and growth in this particular context. You know, the, the, I would sum it up by saying you get what you pay for. And we have to appreciate that a social services system is really government's way of taking monies from you today to provide, um, if you will, stability for you in the future. And it is intended to say whether that is through income replacement um, and there's unemployment, whether that is through um, health care in the form of um, the ones that we have, you know, the, the temporary health care drug plan, or even a pension um, towards the end of the day. I think that we have relied too heavily solely on national insurance and not expanded. Um, how do we teach people to become fishers as opposed to simply being provided a fish uh, or fishermen, I should say, that we need to get to a point where we are understanding that you have to set aside today in order to have something in the future. And government is only in the middle of that as a facilitator, providing a vehicle that allows you to invest effectively so that there's a return and there's a, um, a safety net at the end. Unfortunately, in the Bahamas, and I may get crucified for saying this, we want to live a capitalist lifestyle, but with a socialist uh, protection safety net. And mm -hmm. the two are not congruent, that we have to appreciate that we have to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. But most importantly, the social services programs that we implement need to demonstrate very clearly that we are creating an equitable tax system that tax all persons on a relative even playing field and then redistribute those resources to those who are the least among us and needed the most. Indeed. So, Peter, we want to ask you, Dr. Blair, what your thoughts are with regard to our social system how do we handle social insurance moving forward? What do you think tax implications need to be around our economy, but also around the way that people live in their everyday lives so that we can have recovery in the short term, but really and truly growth over the longer term? Yeah, this is a great question, Carlos. I'll partition my comments in two pieces. First, I'll start with the individual and then the broader community and then the government. 
we have to think about what are things that we can do as individuals and families to make sure that our reliance on government services is reduced. So for example, every morning I go and I walk up and down the hill with my mom. My mother is 75 years old and she can run, she can swim, she, she's mobile. Why? Because she's beating the yard every day, she's walking up and down the hill. So we have to begin to invest in our health. We also have to invest in our wealth as well too. That does not mean that there's no rule for the government to. The rule for the government is to do some of the things that we can't do for ourselves. And what I think is a missing piece of the conversation is that the Bahamas is very effective at collecting taxes. When we implemented the VAT, there was a concern that we would have not been able to get all the VAT money. But we over-collected on VAT. And we were so successful that we had, we had hundreds of thousands of dollars in surplus from that. So our issue is not a tax collection issue, certainly from the, the middle class of, of our society. I do think we have a tax collection issue when it comes to the upper class of our society, when we think about the reduction of stamp, um, taxes on properties valued over several million dollars. We should not be doing that. We should not be providing unrestricted concessions to, to large hotels that are coming into our country where we're giving away um, thousands of acres at about $3,000 per acre. We're effectively giving away the people's future by the ways in which we're trying to attract foreign direct investment, which itself is not proven to be productive in, in our particular context. And I think that that's something that we really need to, to take an eye on is how do we collect more resources or at least give less concessions to people who already have the money so that we don't have to more extensively tax people who don't have the money. Thanks, Peter. So we're here on You and Your Money, and we're having a conversation with Dr. Peter Blair, who is a professor of economics at Harvard Graduate School of Education, and Mr. Gowan Bo, who is the CEO of the Fidelity Group of Companies. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to wrap up our conversation here about recovery and economic growth in the Bahamas. We'll be back right after this quick break. I need a new start. It's a new beginning. I applied and got my lot loan from Fidelity. Finally, we're moving forward. Don't miss the Shell Holiday Extravaganza for a chance to win over $40,000 in amazing prizes. It's easy to win. Fuel up with $20 gas at any Shell service station. Complete the entry form on your receipt. Take a picture of it and WhatsApp it to 422-0271. Or upload it at winwithshellbahamas.com. For a chance to win cash, staycations, grocery vouchers, jumbo gift certificates, free fuel, and so much more. Conditions apply. Happy holidays from Shell. Since 1967, Freeport Oil Company Limited has been dedicated to fueling growth and prosperity in the Bahamas. We have been a constant pillar within the country, striving to invest and support our community through the best of times and the worst of times. For us, Full Call represents 21 years of strength and consistency, consistent leadership, consistent growth, consistent customer service. Through it all, we are resilient. Full Call, fueling growth for people. I didn't think I would ever pay down my debt. It's a new beginning. Fidelity Financial Coaching was the solution that I needed. Welcome back to you and your money. And we're having a conversation with Mr. Gowan Bo, who is the CEO of the Fidelity Group of Companies, and Dr. Peter Blair, who is a professor of economics at the Harvard Graduate School, Graduate School of Education. Uh, Dr. Blair, we have right now in our country a question with regard to our labor force. And Gowan made mention of the fact that we don't have the kind of productivity in our economy that we should have. 
There are concerns that with virtual and hybrid learning, we are now having a situation where our kids, our young persons are not set up for what we would call higher productivity and even just personal growth in the future. What is your perspective on where we're at with our education, with our labor force, how we're going to be able to move forward based on what we're seeing so far? Do we need to adapt? And if so, what should we adapt to make sure that we don't end up with effectively uh, two or three years of virtual and hybrid education really turning into almost what we would call a lost decade or two of productivity growth and production? Peter? Yeah. Yeah, Carlos, what, what the research shows is that each additional year of education increases a person's earnings by 7%, 7%. Now, when we think about the disruption of COVID-19 has brought with online and hybrid education, what you need is access to an internet, you need to have access to a computer, and then you probably need an adult who's going to supervise that learning. So those are three inputs. If you come from a two-parent family household where one of the parents earns enough so that the other parent could stay home and supervise that learning. For the most part, we've not seen in the research learning loss for folks in the upper quintile of the income distribution. When you look at folks, the bottom 80%, the learning losses have been staggering, number one. Number two, hybrid education and even online education is no substitute. It's about 20% less effective according to some research estimates. What we need to do is to recognize that by having in-person education, there are two things that happens. One is it frees up parents to go back to work who can safely do that. So in the short term, that helps with, with increasing the labor supply within the country. That's going to boost the economic productivity. In the long term, by sending kids back to school, they have an opportunity to build those social relationships to get the human capital that they're getting in school, which is going to be important for them 12 years down the road being a productive member of society so that Mr. Bo can hire them at their company or provide the venture capital to them that they need to see the idea for the next Facebook, Lyft, or Google. The interesting thing is, I think we have to go back to basics. Um, our forefathers placed a very high stock in education, meaning when we were coming into independence and even prior to that. And that's why we had the government high and, and all of the uh, mm -hmm. alumni from that era really um, brag about, you know, the, the benefit of it. But the government high led to higher competition, which elevated the education standards. I think now we need to take a step back. And for those of us who have parents who are teachers and, and, and relatives that are teachers, they will say to you, we have to, I'm going to say reinvest in our love of education. We need to take it seriously from the grandparents, parents, um, that we are investing in our children and not seeking for the school system to do it alone. Uh, my grandmother was the one who taught me time. Um, my parents were the one who taught me times tables. You know, it was really something that said education became a fabric of life. And to Peter's point, you know, I fully endorse that, that I, to this day, if I am in any year that I've not learned something new, I consider it a lost year. Now, uh, whether it, 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 it exponentially increases my earnings, as Peter said, I'm going to start tracking that uh, just to make sure that I, my, my pay requests are appropriate. But I think the reality is we have to invest in education and not see it as an outlay of funds or sending a child to school. We have to invest the time, energy, and the importance to our children to let them understand that there are many things that can be taken away from you. Education is not one. Indeed. Gentlemen, thank you so much. This has been an extremely fruitful conversation. Uh, as Peter said, we have to think differently about how we're handling virtual and hybrid learning. I remember uh, in kindergarten and grade one, I think being outside under the tree, sitting down in my chair, um, those were very important periods because now when I go tomorrow to Mr. Bo uh, for my loan, for my business, uh, hopefully is going to see that all of this 20 something years of education that I've gotten has been worth the while for him to take a risk on me. Uh, Mr. Gowanbo, CEO of the Fidelity Group of Companies, Dr. Peter Blair, uh, Professor of Economics at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. We thank you so much for being here on You and Your Money. Wishing you health and prosperity. Thank Indeed, you. likewise, you Gowan. Was. Indeed, thanks, Peter. This has been another episode of You and Your Money. I'm your host, Carlos Mackey. Thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you all. Take care. Come on.